Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was invited to speak to you tonight when the organization found out that I had done something rather nerdy during my student years. Because every Thursday, for several years, I would get up at 4.30 in the morning to take a three-hour train ride across the country. I'm from Groningen, and I was going to Leiden. Every day, uh, or every week, <laughs> to read this kind of stuff. <laughs> so here you see ancient Greek. Um, the language in the middle is Sanskrit, Old Indic. This is a part of the Rig Veda, um, one of the holy texts of Hinduism. Um, down here you see the Edda, which is one of the texts that in Old Norse, the language of the Vikings. Uh, I read Roman comedies written 150 years before Julius Caesar, then General Caesar, crossed the Rubicon and carried the Roman Republic to its grave. You may wonder, why was I doing this? And um, by the way, Wednesday night was the big night in Groningen, so <laughs> you can just imagine the extent of my passion when I was doing it. Uh, the, the reason I was doing this is that I was very, and I still am, very fascinated by the fact that all of these languages and many more, actually, are related to each other. So these are all ancient languages, or more or less ancient languages. And if you go back a few thousand years in time, they all come from the same language. And not only these ancient languages, but if you, of course, like logically, also the successors of these languages, right? So modern Greek, uh, Hindi, Urdu, um, uh, English, Dutch. Actually, all of these, um, it's a little bit hard to read, but it, it's, uh, could you maybe raise your hand if your language comes from this area? So if you're from Mozambique, for example, Portugal counts, right? Could you raise your hands if, you're, if you speak English, if you speak Dutch as a native language, or, or Hindi, or Urdu? Is there anyone whose native language is not on this map? Yeah? Chinese? Well, yeah, Chinese is a Chinese language. <laughs> <laughs> Any other ones? Yeah? Finland. Finland. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so the, the, the Finnish is related to Hungarian, as, as you said, and to Estonian, of course, and to a number of uh, languages in the Uralic region. Um, we're not entirely sure. There are some hints that they may be related to Indo-European. That's what we call this whole group of languages, obviously, after India and Europe, where they originated. Sorry? <laughs> well, I love all languages, so I'm, 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 I'm happy with it with any of them. Um, so, if you think about it, this, these languages cover 3 billion people, 46% of the world's population. And that's pretty cool. So if you, and that's, that's, that's English, that's Italian, French. And if you take Italian and French, for example, someone from Italy who goes to Paris cannot make himself understood in Italian because Italian and French are, are different enough. Um, but if you go back in time, and just imagine that you have all the texts in French and Italian, and you go back in time, you see them in front of your eyes. There is one point, and these texts, as you go back in time, they become more and more similar, right? There's one point where these guys start understanding each other. This point is around the year 800, 700, around, around that time, AD. Um, and if you go back further in time, so all of this, these three billion people would be able to understand each other. I think, that, I think that's a fascinating, fascinating idea. Um, and I want to basically take you on that journey. Um, and for that purpose, I have uh, acquired a time machine uh, from a Belgian professor who didn't need it anymore. <laughs> I wish, by the way, that Nerd Knight was paying me for this presentation because it was a bit of an expensive thing. Um, but this is the way it works. So it's, it's, it's old, I told you. The way it works is it, um, uh, you put in a, 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 like a, a word, in this case, uh, the, the case the word eight, uh, because I want to talk about French and Italian. So French huit, Italian otto. There you go. Uh, so the way this thing works is, uh, there you go. You see, it prints the words. And then as, as it goes back in time, you see the languages change. So in 2017, the French say huit. Then if you go back in time, this is really exciting, guys. <laughs> Building up tension. If you go back in time, you see huit, huit, oit, oct, octo. 
So what I said, I mean, Oct and Octo are perfectly intelligible mutually, right? And let's, let's, let's go back. So they will both go back to Latin, which Latin has Octo. Let's add a few more languages, because now we're at the year zero, roughly, when Latin was spoken. We can go further. We can go back all the way to, we don't really know when, but let's say fourth, the third millennium, 4000 BC, something like that. So let's, oh, yeah, there you go. Um, so I've added Greek octo, Gothic achtal. Gothic is a Germanic language, just like Dutch and English and uh, German and Swedish. So I think the Dutch and the Germans recognize their own acht in here. Are there any Scandinavians in the room? Yeah? W which language do you speak? Swedish. Swedish. Do you recognize otta in here? A bit, a little bit. Yeah. Well, yeah. Doable. Um, <laughs> anyway, we're, we're going we're gonna to put our time machine to work, just to go back in time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there you go. Um, the point being, it all goes back to something that was pronounced octo, or octo, or something like that, but I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce it. Um, and in case you guys were just thinking, uh, this is a party trick that I can do with the word eight, uh, here's a huge matrix with the numbers two to ten in a whole variety of Indo-European languages. And I'm showing this big complicated thing partly because it's nerd night and this is my chance to bore you with this stuff. <laughs> But mostly to show you how systematic this is. There is a system, there's a method to this madness. Look at the, uh, the sixes and sevens. They start with S's in most of the languages because they all come from the same word. In Greek, the S at the beginning of a word has changed to an H. So that's why you have Greek hex instead of sex and hepta instead of septem. Pretty cool, right? Um, all the nines start with N's, for example, almost all of them. Um, and uh, what I would like to show in the rest of, of, of my talk is the, the show you a little bit about the system behind, behind these things. So, because there's something beautiful about how sounds change. And it's the fact that sounds change in a very, very regular manner. In English, they call that the Ausnahmslosigkeit der Lautgesetze. Um, <laughs> it's, really, it's really how they call it. Um, so, but it means that sound laws, so when one sound changes into another sound, they systematically change across the entire language. For example, for many people will speak Dutch in this room. Dutch is now undergoing a, um, uh, the V in Dutch. Ever more people are pronouncing it like an F. This is a, like a, a, a change that started somewhere in the north, and it's, just, it's working its way south as we speak. And earlier changes that we are starting to not pronounce the N at the end of words anymore, right? We're, most words that end in E-N, we don't pronounce the N anymore. And there's not a single exception to be found. Well, maybe one, but it's not as if praten is pronounced praten and lopen is pronounced lopen. No, it's across the language. So sound change is, is regular. And if you think about it a little bit, that means that you can, just by applying logic, you can go way back in history. Because if we play this, this, this time machine thing again, and you see all of the texts in front of your eyes, and you go back in time. You, the languages are converging, and there's one moment as you go back in time where the screen goes black. That's the moment when you've entered prehistoric times because people just simply didn't write. So for the Romance languages, we have Latin before that, and before Latin we had Old Latin, and before Old Latin we had nothing. So that's where, where it goes black. But for example, Germanic. Um, was never written down. It was spoken around the same time as, as Latin, maybe slightly earlier. But we don't, we, the only way we can find out what it was like is by reconstructing, by just applying logic. And to show you a little bit how this is done, I have um, found two sentences in a, um, thank you, from, from a famous fairy tale. Um, and I was just wondering, is there somebody who speaks Farsi here, modern Persian? or modern Greek, or German. <laughs> would, you, would you want to read out the, the first sentence? I don't really have a microphone. Yeah, just, just, just shout. <laughs> oh, that's the microphone. There you go. Er wartete, aber bis der Vater kam und sprach zu ihm, 
Das fremde Mädchen ist mir entwischt. Keine andere soll meine Gemahlin werden als die, an deren Fuß dieser goldene Schuh passt. Beautiful. Thank you. Do we have any native French speakers who want to do the French? No? We have the French here. Yeah? Oh, good, good, good. Thank you. Vous êtes prêts On peut parler français. Donc, euh, cependant, il attendit l'arrivée du père et lui dit, deux points, ouvrez les guillemets. <rire> ah, c'est une dissension la, maintenant. <rire> la, la jeune fille inconnue m'a échappé. Nul ne sera mon épouse que celle dont le pied chaussera ce soulier d'or. Beautiful. Fermez les guillemets. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone know from which fairy tale these quotes are Cinderella. And who wrote Cinderella? Or who made it famous? Sorry, sorry somebody said it already. Grim. The Grimm brothers. Exactly. Well, I'm going to build in a little cliffhanger here, guys, because we, we're going to hear more about the Grimm brothers later on in our presentation. Or one of them. The reason why I gave you these, these sentences is well, partly to show, of course, we know how different these languages are. But actually, there are still traces you can still see how related they are as well. I only put these sentences because I'm interested in the words for father and foot. Uh, I know, this was just a little drama. So, that, um, so you see, uh, maybe people have difficulty reading the Greek, uh, pateras podi or something, I don't know how they pronounce it. Um, in Persian, it's a bit hard to read, it says pedar and pa. Uh, so this is English and German, or German and English, and then three languages from other branches of Indo-European. I think you probably roughly see that these words are related to each other. Do you see something systematic that the Germanic languages have different from the other ones? It's quite obvious. Yeah. The P has changed into an F. The P, the, exactly. Yeah, the P has changed into an F. Exactly. Exactly. And. Um, that is, that is indeed systematic across, uh, across the, the Germanic language. You think if you know another one, for example, if you know Dutch, you can just fill it in, and you'll see that Dutch also has an F. Often the F has changed to a V in Dutch, but now it's at the point of changing back again. So, <laughs> so it's systematic, guys, and that's, that's actually very exciting. Um, because, so you, you, you already mentioned it, the P has changed into an F, and P and F are quite close to each other. But the system is bigger, because not only have, has the P changed into an F, the T has also changed into a th sound, which then went on to evolve into, into Ds, for example, in other languages. Um, and the K sound has changed into a H, and the later H sound. Um, yeah. So there's a big system here. and. Um, this sound change is what we call the first Germanic sound shift. Let's see if it works now. No, I just sh closed the thing <laughs> up. <laughs> yeah, first Germanic sound shift. Or oh, Grimm's Law, it was the same guy who wrote the fairy tales. Mr. Jacob Grimm. He invented this sound law, true story. <laughs> you must be thinking by now, if there is a first Germanic sound law, how about the second Germanic sound law? <laughs> I can see you think it, um, because there actually was one. Um, the uh, one thing. <laughs> yeah, um, the second Germanic sound shift uh, is what happened only in the German language. Apparently, the Germans were not happy with just sharing the same sound shift with all the other Germanic people. <laughs> they wanted their own. Um, so that's what happened. In the P went on to change into F in German. The T went on to change into Z. And the K went on to change into first K and later H. So there you go. The second Germanic sound shift. Um, I think we've done enough like very nerdy sound shifts and looking at, um, at old uh, sounds and, and words. And Perhaps, perhaps not. You may wonder at this moment, it's all great. I mean, how valid is all of this? We, you've, you've seen my big table with numbers with which I kind of try to show you 
um, that there is a lot of evidence for this. Um, but all of this is with the benefit of hindsight. We know the, 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 the ideal thing in science, which you would like to do, is that you uh, devise a rule, you set up an experiment, and then you check it against uh, what you came up with, right? But it's kind of hard to find new evidence for languages that are dead. Except, I mean, the question is, where do you find it? And obviously, you find it in the ground. Occasionally, something comes up where you can test your hypothesis. And this is exactly what happened in uh, central Turkey in the, the early 20th century. By this time, uh, all of our big hypotheses about, all of our big theories about Indo-European had already uh, uh, been, they were already there. Um, but to tell you about what happened here, I need to take you back to a tragedy that happened in the 13th century before Christ, so a long, long time ago. Um, it happened here in, uh, this is uh, a bit east of Ankara. It's the city of Hattusa. This is what it looks like now. Uh, but in the 13th century before Christ, it was a, a, a beautiful capital of a big kingdom called the Hittites. The, um, uh, this site is called Hattusa or Boaskei. The Hittites were, just to put it in history a little bit for you, because maybe the 13th century BC, you're not quite sure. It's uh, the, the other big country at that time was Egypt, and it was like the time of the Ramses. Ramses II was the big rival of, I don't know if that was exactly 13th century, but that's kind of to position it a little bit. They were big rivals. Um, and at that time, uh, the entire, let's say, federal bureaucracy of this kingdom was still inside the king's palace. So all the departments of justice, like all of them were, were inside the palace. And um, the scribes and all of the civil servants, they were working on clay tablets. Uh, why were they working on clay tablets? Well, one reason was that paper wouldn't be invented for another 10 centuries, so that, that helps. And by, and by the way, it was invented in China, so by the time it reached Turkey, it would, it would take a while. Um, but the other reason is that you can wipe clay tablets. So once you're, you're done writing, you just wipe the thing, which is great, because you never know when the deputy attorney general <laughs> you know, appoints a special prosecutor and your boss asks you to uh, get rid of some stuff. <laughs> Occasionally, I told, you, I told you about a tragedy that happened in that century. Um, it was at one point, there was a fire in the palace. I hope, we don't know exactly, uh, but I hope that everybody knew their emergency drill, nobody got hurt, all the civil servants got out, and they left all their stuff behind. There's one thing we know for sure. And as the fire raged, all of their clay tablets got baked. And you know what happens when clay gets baked, right? It becomes a brick. So all these temporary scribblings, they were baked, and we can still read them. So this is one example of a, of a clay tablet in Hittite. It's written in cuneiform script, uh, which is in Dutch spijkerschrift, German keilschrift, in case you have never heard of cuneiform. Um, and um, around the year 1923, uh, there was a Czech guy who was looking at this stuff because we could already read a couple of these cuneiform scripts, but from other languages. Uh, and none of these languages are Indo-European. They're all Middle Eastern languages. Some of them related to Arabic or, 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 uh, uh, or Hebrew, for example. So he was looking at one of them, and actually he was looking at this very sentence, where he saw, uh, he recognized one, the word in capitals here, that's a, it's like a pictogram for bread. So he knew that that word means, that ninda means bread. Uh, so he was looking at it, he said, okay, bread. And he could read the rest, right? He knew what, what was written, but he just couldn't understand what was there. He saw bread and then et satani. And I was like, et satani? That sounds like to eat, like the English word eat. And, and also the Latin word edere, for example, which gives us edible. He's like, that may be an in the, in, eat, eat next to bread. That's interesting. Let's look at the rest of the sentence. Ecuteni, ecut, aqua. He's like, is this about eating and drinking? And obviously, I think you've already seen the last part of it. So this is what makes me very happy and always brings tears to my eyes. 3,300 years ago, when people were thirsty in the Hittite kingdom, they would ask for a cup of water. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? Thank you. That was my speech.